Dr Hunters, I'm sure you all know, and I imagine that many of you are already familiar with her, her, her work um, and her talks and lectures. I've just enjoyed this afternoon listening to wonderful uh, talks on, on, on uh, YouTube and so on. She's a very distinguished scholar, uh, teacher, theologian and activist. Um, she is the um, co-founder and co-director of the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics and Ritual, which comes with the perfect acronym WATER, so WATER, the, the stuff of life uh, then. And um, she is the author, she's a prolific author of many important books. She's the author of a prize-winning uh, book, uh, Fierce Tenderness, A Feminist Theology of Friendship. And she's the editor and co-editor of many things. And I always think that when people do a lot of editing, there's a generosity of spirit of scholarship uh, to do all of that as, as well as work on your own. So I think that speaks volumes. Um, and, you can look up yourself the many things that she has worked on, uh, but a recent one, New Feminist Christianity, Many Voices, Many Views. So I love that idea of kind of multiplicity, um, which I'm sure that we're going to be hearing a lot about. Um, and um, a guide for women in religion, making your way from A to Z. Um, obviously, the importance of that is reflected in the fact there's a new edition of it published in 2014. Um, so we're delighted to have her. It's a privilege to have her in uh, Trinity College to mark the beginning of this uh, new year. Um, I the comments Mary was making about you know spirituality and flexibility, um, and um, I was listening to one of the talks and I picked out a quote uh, which to me really touched me and I think captures many of the things that uh, she works on that may everyone be able to live freely who they are and I hope that that would apply to, to everyone here for the feminist LGBT community um, for the flexibility of understanding and I think that we're going to be hearing about that uh, her talk mapping 40 years of theology ethics and ritual. So thank you so much. We're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Professor Morris, for your lovely introduction. I'm delighted to join Women's Spirit Ireland to think together about the impact tonight of our collective work in feminist studies in religion. I must begin with Mary Condren. As you know, she is a national treasure. <laughs> she is a brilliant and thorough scholar, highly regarded worldwide for her work on Bridget and re related Celtic themes. And I'm very honored by her invitation. And mostly, I'm delighted that Women's Spirit and Water can work together, have worked together, and hopefully tonight will just be another step along that process. Mary is so generous with her time and talent, so inclusive and welcoming of the work of others. So thank you, Mary, and let's hope that our collaboration continues for many years to come with generations of people who will replace us in the kind of leadership we have given, and I look forward to seeing that happen. And one of Mary's brothers is here, and I hope, Tony, you'll take that back to the family. and. Uh, let me also thank colleagues of Trinity College for this very convenient venue for our conversation. Uh, I'm happy to be here in Ireland. I'm only here for the day, if you can imagine. Um, en route, I was here last week for the week, a wonderful week uh, in the west of Ireland. And then I went to Madrid for the weekend for a conference on c contemplative silence and the work of social justice. That's a topic for another night. Um, but I really am delighted to be here, and I'm glad this worked out so well that we could collaborate in this way. Mary assigned me a book title for tonight's lecture, and it's a good idea for a book, Mary. But I'm going to resist the temptation to tell the whole story by focusing instead on what I think of as the major contours of feminist work in religion and what I think they mean. I'm going to focus particularly in terms of what they mean in practical terms at the moment a time when religious institutions and faith communities, as we have known them, as many of us have grown up in them, are all but over. But people still have needs. Their babies get sick, their mothers die, their cats get stuck in trees, and they need somebody to pay attention to them, and they need to make meaning and value out of those experiences. 
And I think for many people who are bereft now of the kinds of religious anchors with which they grew up, there's a need to at least explore. And I think what's exciting about the work that we do, both Women's Spirit and Water, is that we don't begin at ground zero. We have created now 50 years of feminist work in religion among ourselves and our colleagues. And I think that's a resource that's even more important today. I'm gonna to start with a few comments on recent events here in Ireland and the US. Then I'm going to look at what I consider to be the twin anchors of feminist spirituality, namely religious dynamics on the one hand and feminist action on the other, and those hands hold each other. Religious dynamics and feminist action go together. And I'll conclude with um, using the 2017 Women's March in Washington uh, as an example of how we might work together to enrich and deepen the scene. I'll, I'll look at that as a dynamic and then I'll make some suggestions for us that I hope we can take up in our conversation. I very much look forward to our respondents and to our discussion period when I know all of you will add to my analysis. Let me start with recent events in Ireland and the US. Ireland was ground zero for Catholic attention last month for some reason, I'm not. Uh. <laughs> Until, of course, the Saturday night bombshell exploded from the ex-nuncio to the US, Mr. Vigano and his handlers, but that's another story. I must confess that I was glued to the RTE coverage. Sometimes I felt as if I were here, although I didn't have to wear a raincoat or carry an umbrella. I was deeply impressed by the organization, the boldness, and the courage of sexual abuse survivors and those who demand justice for women and LGBTIQ people and especially for children. I was in a rather cynical way heartened by the smallish crowds that signaled the deep disenchantment with things Catholic institutional. And I thought it was brill to snap up the tickets and not use them. We're gonna try that, we're gonna be Irish about that sometime. Most of all, I wanna thank you, especially survivors and those who love them. Words will never be adequate to express our sorrow with you but words become deeds when through analysis and strategies we focus our energies first and foremost on those who suffer, then on the prevention of violence, and mostly on changing the unjust human conditions that create these injustices to begin with. That means using feminist religious insights to reshape laws, to demand just compensation, to dismiss from their jobs those who have perpetrated crimes, and especially their colluders, no matter who they are. I weep with you in Ireland for the babies, the mothers, the lost childhoods, the adult scars. If you wanna know why we in feminist work and religion do what we do, look no further than the scandals of our day. We are not here to clean up after criminals, especially clergy, but we are here to make sure that they are stopped in their bloody tracks. I recommend the Faith Trust Institute in Seattle, Washington in the US as one more resource that you might look at as you deal with these issues. Let me turn to the US for a moment. The Faith Trust Institute, led by the great colleague and friend of ours, um, Dr. Marie Marshall Fortune, the Faith Trust Institute, really the go-to place in the US for these questions. And they may have some resources that would be useful, although I know you have your own and they too are useful to us. Then of course came the August grand jury report from Pennsylvania, laying out chapter and verse of 3, 300 priests, 1,000 victims, and thousands more in the offing. I think this was the straw that broke the Catholic camel's back in the US. The level of disgust is high, left, right, and center, leaving the institutional church on very thin ice. I'm amazed by the reactions, horrors at the criminal acts, but equal, if not sometimes greater outrage at the cover-ups. You've been through all this in Ireland, but I'm sad to say we're gonna go through it again and again and again. Lawyers and legislators around my country are discussing similar probes in other states and the need to lift the statute of limitations everywhere. New York State, for example, just began its inquiry with a subpoena to every diocese last week. There are 48 more states to go. These cases were made public shortly after Theodore McCarrick, the Cardinal of Washington, D.C., was punished by the Vatican 
both for his early cases, which had been paid off and covered up over the decades when he was a bishop in New Jersey, and now for his apparently credible accusations of pedophilia, but mostly for his well-known custom of going to bed with whatever seminarian or young priest he desired. Business as usual, we have been led to believe. Everyone said, well, everyone knew. I didn't know, but everyone knew. I, I, I don't know. I, I must have been sleeping, but <coughs> reactions have been swift and far reaching across the ideological spectrum with mounting calls for his res the resignation of his successor, a Mr. C Donald Wuerl, Cardinal Wuerl, whose departure I think is imminent both for his many mistakes in Pennsylvania while in leadership there and his lack of attention to the McCarrick case. Then just to kind of frost the cake came the Saturday night screed from the archbishop who wants to be Cardinal Carlo Maria Vigano who ran roughshod over the, testimony, the territory with accusations and innuendos, many based on old grudges, the kind of politics in the church. His hysterical anti-gay fuming made one wonder if the gentleman doth protest too much. He ends with a plaintive plea in his famous letter for the resignation of Pope Francis. Vigano quickly went to ground, didn't surface to explain, document, or defend his letter until he published a second one a week later with more damning accusations and later proof that in 2000, the Vatican indeed knew of Cardinal McCarrick's misdeeds. So the plot thickens in Catholicism and what makes the Borgias look like Boy Scouts on a camping trip. <laughs> Meanwhile, survivors, women, LGBTIQ people, and others who are outside the circles where such rants take place are left to piece together spiritual survival, survival now that the apparatus of Catholicism has proved unable to carry the freight of the gospel. This is nothing new to feminists. In my view, the institutional church is morally and soon to be economically bankrupt. People in the US are leaving Catholicism by the droves and lawsuits will sap whatever economic resources remain. But our work as feminists in religion continues apace. I say this not with a cavalier attitude, but with a heavy heart. The reality is that many of us long ago left the mess behind, though not the people, especially those, I repeat, who are victim survivors. They continue to be a major concern. And that's why we do the work that we do, both to understand and to explain what has gone on, but more particularly to create resources so that all of us who have the human right to be religious or spiritual or not, according to our lights, may do so. That need has become more acute in the last several months and in the last several years. And I see that only increasing. Let me turn then to the twin anchors of feminist spirituality, namely religious dynamics and feminist action, as a way of thinking about this together. I turn to the feminist work in religion, especially in the US with which I'm most familiar, as it stands in sharp contrast to this institutional concern with which I've begun. Religious dynamics and feminist action are all around us. We do not, I repeat, start at ground zero. We have resources for ourselves and for our colleagues, for our friends and our families, many of whom don't have the time or the luxury or even the interest to study as some of us do but they still have the need to make meaning and value in their own lives. And in my view, they have the human right to do this with all the help we can provide. Feminist and religious studies have various starting points. I work at the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual, WATER, as was mentioned. And like Women's Spirit Ireland, we're a nonprofit educational organization in the Washington, D.C. area, or what we call in Spanish, el estomaco de la bestia, the, in the stomach of the beast or the heart of the beast, but the stomach of the beast I like better. For 35 years, water has been a go-to place for feminist studies in religion. I don't mean to make it sound grandiose. Those who've been there know it isn't. But competition is not keen in this niche market, and our modest office is a testament to that. But we've created and we nurture, and now for 35 years, the so-called new space that Mary Daly called for in her feminist philosophy the new space where the academic study of religion meets the real needs of people seeking spiritual lives. Whether a woman minister who comes for spiritual direction or a graduate student who uses our library for his feminist research, 
whether a Mennonite intern or an Icelandic scholar, the many and varied people who come to water, who are part of water, who read water material, some of you listen to programs, those people constitute the very map that we're considering tonight. But over the decades, I would say the map has become more like a GPS. The amazing proliferation of books, journals, articles, and podcasts only increases in quantity, complexity, and variety. What began as a predominantly white, Christian, and Jewish field is now exponentially diverse as colleagues from Islam, Buddhism, pagan and Wiccan groups, indigenous religions, Hinduism, many other traditions, including the spiritual but not religious, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, and yes, some of the N-U-Ns too, and some of my favorites, the never agains, oh to be so sure. But more importantly, I think many of our colleagues are not white. They are women and men of color who come from many races and many nations. There are people who come from many specialties, both academic and ministerial. And there are people who are just plain plum interested, who do not come from any particular formation in religious studies or in religious life, God forbid, but they come from their own hearts and souls of interest. In water circles, we have found that there are increasingly useful and fascinating materials that relate not simply to women, but in the words of the great feminist scripture scholar Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza, to the interlocking forms of oppression, including racism, ecocide, homo hatred, transphobia, economic inequality, ableism, and all these forms of oppression that constitute her famous and very helpful phrase, curiarchy, structures of lordship. Remember curiarchy? Yeah. I love the term curiarchy because most of the feminist work in religion is in fact explicitly dedicated to eliminating these interstructured forms of oppression. At Water, we affirm that our efforts, and we say this at every program, are geared to bring feminist religious values to the work of social change. We reject myths of scholarly objectivity, and we discourage the study of religion simply for its own sake. Rather, we recognize the important role of spiritual values in personal and communal life, and we encourage everyone, especially women and those who've traditionally been marginalized from the construction of religion, to become protagonists of our own spirituality, to become protagonists. Now, I have nothing against the study of religion. I spent um, more years than I can count doing it, but I think the connection to what needs to happen in the world enriches that study and gives it a kind of meaning and focus that simply an academic discipline or an academic pursuit is missing. The intellectual ter terrain, however, is doubtless interesting on a good day. But the fact is that we live in not such good days. I live in the United States, which is embroiled in a political situation as scandalous as it is dangerous. Religiously fueled ideology played a real role in the election of our current president. White evangelicals were especially enthusiastic supporters and voters. Let me quote from one of the studies. The majority of non-college educated white women, 64% voted for Trump, 35% backed Hillary Clinton. This figure is far higher than the non-college educated black women of which only 3% voted for Trump. And non-college educated Hispanic women only 25% voted for Trump. Black, Hispanic, and other non-white women backed Clinton in far larger numbers than white women. That tells me something. I'm a white woman, a Catholic feminist, theologian, a US citizen. For women like me, the gender dynamics are all too familiar. But it's because of our commitment to the curiarchy, to eradicating the range of issues that I think many of us who didn't vote for Mr. Trump knew enough not to. But for those for whom the single issue of whatever it could be that he was selling worked, it was enough. The gender dynamics are very obvious. Catholic women need not apply when it comes to ordained ministry or priesthood. Priesthood or clerical status is necessary for decision making or what we call jurisdiction. In other words, if you're not a priest, you can't decide. 
whether a parish hall can be used for a meeting of lesbian and gay Catholics, whether the resources of a congregation can go to support a project in Haiti. It's not that women are clamoring to get up and celebrate mass at seven o'clock in the morning, but we want to make decisions about how the resources of our communities are used and what it means to develop creative forms of worship. 35 years ago, my similarly trained partner, Diane New, and I started Water because we were literally dressed up with no place to go. Over the years, Water has sponsored scores of programs and retreats, hundreds of rituals and meditation sessions, dozens of monthly teleconferences with some of the brightest people in the field, sharing their work by telephone with people all over the world, and then the work is made available on the web. You too can listen to any of it free. <coughs> We've engaged in countless articles, blogs, liturgies, and books. Most important, we've developed an alliance of people who do this work and who want to do it together, including a very vibrant alliance called the Feminist Liberation Theologians Meeting uh, Network that meets every year at the American Academy of Religion. This year's topic is economics. We had more than 80 water interns, including Catholics, Protestants, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, and those who profess no religious faith whatsoever, the so-called NONES, and yes, we've had NUNs too. I lay out this context to illustrate one example of religious dynamism and feminist action. Water's work is at the same time academic, promoting and engaging in cutting edge research and writing in the field, and it's also practical, encouraging, and engaging in activism based on feminist religious values of justice and equality. As I look back at these first 35 years of Water, two issues ground my analysis. One is how the concern about gender has changed religions, and the other is the relationship between feminist studies and religion and social activism. Let me look at how concern about gender has changed religions. As a feminist scholar activist, I'm particularly interested in this question, the impact of gender-related issues on the well-being of Earth, its inhabitants, human and others. If religions are ways we connect, the Latin religere, with one another over shared beliefs and practices, then the quality of that connection is not trivial. Justice and equality are hallmarks of right relation in many traditions, and the interconnection between and among justice issues now frames feminist religious scholarship. You'll recall that it was in July of 1848, I don't think many of us were there, when the first Seneca Falls Convention was held in the Wesleyan Chapel in that small historic town in upstate New York. Elizabeth Cady Stanton read the Declaration of Sentiments and Grievances that became the basis of US women's claims to equality with men, including, of course, the right to vote. And it was that same suffrage leader, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who in 1895, with her revising committee, published something called the Women's Bible. I'm sure many of you have studied it. Yes? You know how they did it. Each woman, and these were women who didn't have any theological studies. They hadn't done Greek or Hebrew. Latin was unknown to them. But they each had two copies of the Bible and a pair of scissors. And they went through one of the copies. One copy they kept whole, and the other copy they went through and cut out all of those verses that had to do with women. And they dealt them out to one another and went home, and they each wrote their exegesis or their explanation of what these things meant, not what they had learned from sitting listening to sermon after sermon, but what they thought. Well, in 1895, the publication of this book was greeted without much fanfare, and it went out of print very quickly. But in fact, it was revived in the 1970s as interest in matters of women and religion began to grow. About a half a century later, in 1960, there was near Seneca Falls, there must be something in the water up there in that part of New York State. I happen to be from there, too. Um, Mary Daly's not, is from not far from there either. There must be something, we always say something in the water up there. But um, in 1960, there was the first, as far as I know, English language literature piece published on religion and gender. Professor Valerie Saving Goldstein of a small college in that area wrote, and I quote, the human situation, a feminine view. The human situation, a feminine view. Do you teach that, art? does somebody teach that here? Do you teach that article? That's the first article that I know of in English on feminist issues in religion. Valerie Saving argued that the nature of sin was different for men and for women. Now, some of us might argue that women don't sin, so that, that's a problem. But, but just let's go with her for a minute. 
meant, she said, sin by erring on the side of power, taking up a lot of space, taking up a lot of airtime, while women's sins tend to be the opposite, not taking other women seriously, trivializing ourselves, multitasking. She didn't know the word, but that's what she was talking about. You know, you're you know, ironing a blouse and cooking dinner and diapering the baby all kind of at once. She said women lack an organizing center. Her point was that if Jesus in the Christian tradition came to save all men from sins of pride, as some of the leading Protestant theologians of her day argued, perhaps Jesus didn't come to save women at all. Or as I like to think about it, perhaps the Bible should have a warning on it like a cigarette package suggesting it might be dangerous for every woman's spiritual health. Regardless of your view of Valerie Savings' work, the main contribution was that it was only by 1960 the scholars began to realize, and I'd say probably even later because the article was rather obscure, probably 10 years later, the scholars began to realize that religion is a gendered activity, just as it's a racialized activity. Religion is a gendered activity. Most scholars didn't know that and some of them haven't figured it out yet. But her insight opened many, many doors to new religious practices and new thinking based on what I think is now the obvious idea that religion is a many gendered thing. As feminist work in religion progressed in tandem with the second wave of the women's movement and theologies of liberation in the 1970s, feminist philosopher Mary Daly's signal volume Beyond God the Father emerged. She popularized the problem of gender. Mary Daly really popularized the problem by saying that if God is male, then the male is God. From this very simple, clear insight flowed what are now five decades of scholarship in virtually every religious tradition, not just Christianity and Judaism, not just by white women, not just by European and American women, but women all over the world dealing with the implications of gender in shaping religions and societies. Investigations and changes in doctrines, practices, rituals, and especially language and imagery of the divine are now common in the world's religions. I dare say these conversations have not usually been easy. Many of them have not been friendly. And in some cases, they have not been the least bit rational. But that's all the more reason why they're important. As more and more women become religious leaders, the urgency of this conversation increases lest they simply replicate the models they inherit. That's my big problem with the question of Catholic women priests. I think many of them are replicating the models that they've inherited. Topic for another night, dears. The reaction to gender, however, as a category for analysis and change has not been universally positive. For example, Pope Francis weighed in on this. He said, and I quote, a great enemy of marriage today is the theory of gender. Today there's a global war trying to destroy marriage. They don't destroy it with weapons, but with ideas. It's certain ideological ways of thinking, he said, that are destroying it. We have to defend ourselves from ideological colonization. Hmm. I disagree with the Pope's assessment and find it woefully ill-informed, she understated. I doubt he could cite serious feminist scholars of religion trying to destroy anything other than, pardon the term, patriarchy. Rather, we seek to create and construct on the basis of evolving insights. But Pope Francis did get one thing right. I'll give him this. There are practical implications of gender theory in daily life that, in my view, will make the world safer for women and dependent children and also safer for men. Attention to gender is not only about women, though it's principally about women despite the rather neutral sounding term. What began as a search for women and women's experience hidden in texts, shrouded in prejudice, is now a new frame for thinking about all human experience in its endless particularity. Anti-racism work, efforts to erase heterosexism, attention to the ways in which ableism rears its ugly head, all seek to decenter hegemonic masculinity, white supremacy, homo and trans hatred, body barriers, and body shaming. These analytic efforts are intricately related to the work of gender transformation and the interstructured and interconnected efforts to bring about justice and equality. However, the change in terms is interesting. What began as women's studies in religion, later feminist studies in religion, or vice versa, depending on where you started, and more lately the vanilla gender studies, 
ought not to obscure, in my view, the activist agenda implicit in most of the work. While some academics shy away from even conversation about act activism, much less engaging in it, I think it's important to acknowledge that most who are in this field are engaged in this work, not simply as an academic interest. Such scholar activists are concerned to create a safer, more just and equitable world, and these, I think, are not mutually exclusive purposes. One can be engaged in the intellectual work as well as in the activism, and that, I think, is the gold standard. Religion has the power to shape basic values and ideas, that's why. The editorial statement of the premier journal in the field, the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion, uh, full disclosure, I'm on the board, co-founded by feminist Christian biblical scholar Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza and Jewish feminist theologian Judith Plaskow conveys this point very clearly. May I quote from the editorial board and the editor's introduction. The editors are committed to rigorous thinking and analysis in the service of the transformation of religious studies as a discipline and the feminist transformation of religious and cultural institutions. Let me say that again. They're committed to the rigorous thinking and analysis in the service of the transformation of religious studies as a discipline and the feminist transformation of religious and cultural institutions. I hear their reminiscences both of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and of Mary Daly in the changing dynamics of religion put to the service of social change. What could be more useful for us today? Let me look then at the relationship between feminist studies and religion and social activism. Given this history, it's not surprising that many who now work in the field of feminist studies are keenly aware of how important it is not to simply add women and stir, as I warned some years ago. Rather, we seek to change those religious beliefs and practices which run counter to the well-being of all who are marginalized, whether by gender, race, sexual identity, age, ability, or the like. Obvious examples relate to reproductive justice, LGBTIQ rights, and environmental questions for which nuanced intersectional analysis in many forms is needed. These data become part of a hermeneutic, part of a way of looking at texts and practices. I think of your own work here in Ireland on Bridget and the Kaliak tradition as examples. It's not simply for themselves, but for the kind of richness that they bring, both in terms of your history and in terms of your current spiritual needs. But for those who perceive religions as unchanging, there's a lot of people like that, gender, anti-racism, and related analyses present a serious challenge. But for those who join moral theologian Daniel McGuire, and I'm one of them, in affirming what he brilliantly called the renewable moral energy of religion, isn't that a sweet phrase? The renewable moral energy of religion. Then this kind of work that I'm describing is second nature. It's not leaving our religious traditions aside, but it's assuming that there's renewable moral energy there. It's a wonderfully ecological phrase, Tom Bien. Jake, you might want to use it. Um, it's a, do you use it? Yeah. It's a great phrase, the renewable moral energy of religion. We recognize that the same religions that are the sources of visions and impetus for justice can also be barriers to the accomplishment of visions and justice. This is a fraught and vexed but real situation. Now liturgies and rituals are one of the primary ways in which most people meet religion. When their mother dies or their community celebrates a holy day like Rosh Hashanah today, and inclusive language about the divine and about human beings makes a big difference at the very basic level of whether some people can pray or not. You'd think people in ministry would be interested in whether you could pray or not. But efforts in Christianity to move beyond the Father, Lord, Ruler, King vocabulary for the divine, especially in hymns and preaching, have been singularly unsuccessful. I don't know, maybe you've figured it all out in Ireland, but I've never uh, seen it figured out anywhere. That language set, those images continue to be used by people in mainline religious traditions. At the same time, many women-led religious groups are in the political mainstream. Maybe they can't make it work in their churches or their synagogues or their temples, whatever it may be. For example, Muslims for, profess for Progressive Values, whose president, Annie Zonenfeld, discusses women imams and queer Muslims in popular media. Goes right out in LA, and she lives in LA, and goes right out, talks about these things in the popular media that begins to change the understanding, maybe not so much in Islam, but among other people, to know that there are queer people who are Muslims. 
that there are women imams. And I hope that that process is mutually transformative, both within the tradition and in the political arena. The Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance, for example, started by Blue, by Blue Greenberg, is made up of Orthodox Jewish women, expanding the spiritual, ritual, intellectual, and political opportunities for women in the framework of halakha, of Jewish law. These are all foundational challenges to major religious traditions on the basis of gender that find expression in the larger public arena. Politically connected women's groups do not stop with so-called women's issues. Let me give you a Catholic example. Some of you have heard of Network, the lobby for Catholic social justice, sometimes now understood as the nuns on the bus. Have you seen this where the, the nuns uh, are running around on buses to uh, showcase the excellent work that people are doing for social change? They got their start when a good Catholic boy in Congress said that his uh, Trumpian values were expression of Catholic social teaching, and they said, oh, no, 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 you've got that wrong, Paul Ryan. And they're starting another bus trip, by the way, next month, and they're going to go all through the south of the, of the US, and they're going to end up at a place called Mar-a-Lago, which is the, uh, uh, the home of our current, maybe he won't be by then, but our current president uh, in Florida. But it was these women who um, came to the attention not only of the government, but also of the Catholic bishops when they campaigned in favor of Obamacare, in favor of health care, expanded to many more people. And they, and not the bishops, became the face of American Catholicism. This did not go over big with the bishops, but it delighted President Obama. And it helped us to see that even such an entrenched tradition as Catholicism could have a new public face. And these are feminist women working in the public arena. I think feminist studies in religion has this same activist component. In the summer of 2017, Feminist Studies in Religion, Inc., which is the one that publishes the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion, gathered scholar activists to consider making alliances, breaking taboos, and transforming religions. It was a rich but very conflicted opportunity to hear from colleagues from several countries and realize, in fact, how hard it is to do this work across race, class, age, religions, nationalities, and other identities. Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, party to that um, particular event and a feminist biblical scholar, published a book recently called Congress of Women, Religion, Gender, and Curiarchal Power. She criticized feminist scholars for leaving aside religion as a resource for social change. I thought that was very significant. And at the same time, she called out religious feminists for universalizing arguments over the fact that women are quite unique and diverse. But her focus, while theoretical, is innately practical as the damage of religious fundamentalism becomes apparent in legislation and public policy. It's important to point out that while we used to know what a woman was and what a man was, today there's no reason to be very confident. Transgender people have changed all of that, and I thank them. The diverse and fluid nature of both gender identity and sexual orientation is widely acknowledged. For example, if a lesbian woman in a relationship decides to become a man, does that make her partner heterosexual all of a sudden? <laughs> if a man transitions to being a woman, does he experience sexism the same way as those who are born women? These are not trivial questions. Ask trans people in the US military who recently had the rug pulled out from under them in a clear case of religiously reinforced notions of sex and gender gone awry. But feminist work doesn't change because it is finally not about women but about all those who are oppressed. That's the subject of our concern. One project that began an important, if I, if I begin to now reconfigure re, um, my GPS, one project that began an important conversation in this regard resulted in a book called Good Sex, Feminist Perspectives from the World's, Religion, World's Religions. Just the title alone, you'd, you'd buy the book. A dozen good sex. It's, my brother-in-law read it and said, oh, how disappointing. Uh, a dozen scholars from eight countries and six religious traditions addressed ourselves to the question of what women think of as good sex. Virtually every religious answer to the question that we had studied up until that point had come from a male perspective. What Jewish men, what Christian men, what Buddhist men, what Hindu men thought was good sex. No one had bothered to ask the women. Indeed, women's answers were different. For example, I addressed myself to the question of just good sex. I want just good sex. 
linking the goodness of sex with the goodness of having housing, food, a job, safety, consent. Rebecca Alpert, my Jewish colleague in the book, took on the matter of taboos when something is bad. I'm sorry, when something is good because it's bad. A Muslim writer looked at women and Islam, uh, Islamic women's sexuality, something you don't read much about. A parallel project was called Heterosexism in Contemporary World Religion, Problem and Prospect, edited by Marvin Ellison and Judith Plaskow, two feminists. Authors from a range of religious traditions explored not homosexuality, about which so much has been written, but heterosexism, a far less studied but deeply problematic theme. These two projects, in my view, are examples of feminist studies in religion moving in the direction not only of interreligious international cooperation, but of reframing the very basic questions and inviting new voices into the conversation. And that's what it means to change the power dynamics in the study of religion. As our religions change on the basis of this kind of feminist work, as their renewable moral energy is unleashed, there is an increase, I think, in resources for social change. But there's a fairly deep drop in the US in numbers of religious adherents, like here in Ireland. A Pew Research study shows this sharp decline in participation in mainline traditions. So it's interesting to look at cases where those who attend to matters of gender, both within and without religion, work together for social change. One such example was the 2017 Women's March in Washington, with marches all over the world. Do you remember this? Do you remember why we marched? Were we right? Large numbers of people took to the streets to reject in public and wholesale terms the values of greed and America first, articulated in what they perceived as sexist, white supremacist, xenophobic statements and policies of the newly elected president and his administration. Little did we know then how much worse things would become 18 months later. The marches were held all over the globe on January 21st, 2017, the day after his inauguration. The election was a referendum on the achievements of the last 40 years in healthcare, civil rights, women's rights, LGBTIQ acceptance, deeper awareness of the needs of immigrants and people living with disabilities. But it was an electoral college win in which three million more people voted for the loser than for the winner. We have an odd system. Russian intrusion into the process and the possibility that a winning campaign may have colluded in such a breach in democratic practices has been part of the evolving fallout. But for many people, the deep question was disbelief following the election and despair. It was bitterly disappointing to see someone who distinguished himself by crude and crass behavior toward women beat a woman candidate. It was horrifying to see unfolding policy agendas rolling back climate change remedies, trumpeting torture, walls, and aggression. Spiritual malaise set in for many people, but the organizers' genius of the marches was to invite and ignite people for action, and that touched a nerve. And I bring that to our attention tonight because millions of people participated. A huge crowd gridlocked Washington, D.C. for hours. We, we couldn't even get home. A handful of women scientists and their penguin friends protested in Antarctica in solidarity. They protested threatened federal research funding cuts. And interestingly, the sociologist Dana Fisher, in a careful look at this in subsequent marches, finds that the resistance is not slowing down. So-called protest fatigue has not set in, as many who marched for women also marched for science, against racism, for the environment, now for immigrants for LGBTIQ rights. We will vote in huge numbers in November, trust me. This does not surprise spiritual feminists. We have long insisted on interstructural analysis and interstructural solutions to myriad social problems. The marches were a case of putting that approach in the service of social change with or without religious input. The role of religion and spirituality is interesting because the very act of gathering was a kind of spiritual statement. Marches and rallies are not feel-good fests. Believe me, it wasn't easy. We were like sardines in the metro getting there. But they were, and they're serious things. But at times, they're lighthearted. A popular chant was, we want a leader, not a creepy tweeter. 
suggestions of people who are working to create a just world were all over the signs and the symbols that made that day happen. And there was nary an arrest in Washington related to the march. That's extraordinary. That, I think, is an articulation of the kind of feminist spirituality we're talking about. There were speeches and music, not hymns or sermons. There were pink knit hats. Remember the pussy hats with the little cat ears? They now have summer versions, by the way. But the heart of the matter was being there, showing up, embodying something that puts the brakes on dismantling of affordable health care, bans on immigrants, violence against people of color, lower tax rates for wealthy people. Remember your own umbrellas a couple weeks ago on the bridge? That was a great protest. But the role of organized religion was relatively small, at least in the actions I know about. Unlike the predecessors during the civil rights and anti-war protests, clergy and religious leaders were not generally in the vanguard, shall we say, though some religious people spoke at rallies. Rather, this kind of spiritual activism was led by Planned Parenthood, the Natural Resources Defense Council, which is a climate change group, Emily's List, which elects pro-choice Democratic women candidates and nay real pro-choice America, supporting abortion, birth control, sex education, and healthy pregnancies. The so-called religious left may be enjoying something of a renaissance, but in its institutional expressions in the US, it's largely patriarchal in substance, mainly male leadership without primary attention to women's issues, a kind of silo approach to which we've become accustomed rather than intersectionality and a preponderance of language, imagery, hymns, and preaching replete with that Father, Lord, Ruler, King language as if decades of our work had never happened. But the partner groups working together had religious feminists in them and in the leadership, groups like Catholics for Choice, Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. These were groups that were deeply engaged and are bringing new forms of life to political action informed by feminist work and religion. So feminist spirituality is one of the most useful explanatory constructs for talking about what happened. What brought people together was not a particular dogma or doctrine, not a particular voting issue. To the contrary, participation in organized religion is on the wane, with NONES outpacing NUNs for new, no new members. But vision and hope are still needed to be lived out in multiple ways that are not competing and mutually exclusive. But that way of thinking about the world, as if there's no one right answer, no single correct way from birth to death, no unified worldview, is not what most people hear from their religious traditions. Instead, many of us have been taught to follow the way, the path, or some other unitary approach that smacks more of concern about religious market share than helping people find ways to live out their commitments in solidarity with one another. I submit that those days are over. We do not have the luxury of that kind of one single way of looking. Rather, the challenge of the 21st century in religion is to find ways to live with many different, overlapping, sometimes seemingly contradictory ways of being in community. It's not easy, but the marches prove that many people are willing to at least give it a try. And that's what feminist spirituality incarnate looks like walking down the street. If you want to know what the fruit of the work of Women's Spirit and Water and other groups has been, those kinds of actions for social change are what feminist spirituality looks like and feminist studies in religion culminate in and look like walking down the street. The arts also played a major role in this kind of social change. It was not surprising on the day of the Women's March that the National Museum of Women and the Arts, which by the way is a a uh, magnificent place if you're ever in Washington. It's the only museum I know of in the world where the art is 99% by women. I was in the Prado uh, over the weekend in, in Madrid, and I said to one of the people there, what percentage of the work in the Prado, you've been there, it's like this is a picnic of art, but what percentage is by women? And he said, well, um, th they weren't doing it in those days. <laughs> I said, not that we know of, not that we know of, but the Women's Museum has, in fact, Dutch, Belgian, French work by women from the 15th, 16th, 17th century. It's quite amazing. But that, me that museum was open without charge that day, and hundreds of people, many of them new to the 30-year-old museum, had their first glimpse of a collection of work 
almost exclusively by women. By the way, the building was originally a Masonic temple, and now I think it's a temple of a feminist sort. <laughs> the intentionally broad agenda that attracted millions of people around the world to march requires no one to be completely satisfied, but everybody willing to give a little. Such is the functional definition of democracy and a functional understanding of feminist studies and religion. Nobody's completely satisfied, and everybody has to give a little in order to make it work. As singer and cultural worker Bernice Johnson Reagan of the women's acapella group Sweet Honey and the Rock put it years ago, if you're in a coalition and you're comfortable, you know it's not broad enough. <laughs> Feminist spirituality is at once functional, coalitional, and lived out in very particular local expressions, whether liturgical, ritual, artistic, athletic, culinary, or in some other creative form. I think that's very exciting because living with discomfort of diversity in order to move forward is not a sign of cheap relativism, but a hallmark of feminist spirituality seeking greater and greater diversity. Without abandoning one's beliefs, it's possible to pass over the rigid, narrow foci that have kept patriarchal, ecumenical, and interfaith efforts from succeeding. It's not a sign of rampant secularization, but so what if it were, if it gets the justice job done? Rather, it's evidence of reasonable and responsible religiosity, better forms of spirituality, which are expressed by embracing a shared vision of human flourishing and cosmic harmony. Such expressions are far more than individual choices. They're about structural barriers and breaking them down to the full participation of people of all races, sexes, abilities, and the like. And they're, a world, they're about a world that most adults want to bequeath to our children and our grandchildren, and that those kids may want to pass on to their own. Calling this spirituality and using the resources of feminist studies and religion does not relegate it to a mystical realm or get one off the hook for critical analysis. Instead, it's a way of seeing social change for the common good at the heart and soul of the human religious project of which feminist studies in religion is a part. Resistance is crucial, but so too is the creativity to build the scaffolding of a just and sustainable society. And that's where I think we are both in Ireland and in the US, as many of the, the social structures and particularly religious structures many of us have grown up with are beginning to fall away. What replaces them? Feminist spiritualities in all of their diversity of expression and priorities, in all of their performative power and interreligious richness are a great source to spark and sustain this work. They're not all we need, but they're really helpful. The visceral memories of the marches, both in the muscles of those who participated in person, I know I walked more than 10 miles that day, and those who observed are motivating factors. We know from that what democracy looks like. We know what it feels like to be moving together in the same direction, however slowly and deliberately, sometimes gridlocked and stymied, but in time, and with cooperation, making our way together. One of the newest articulations, and this is a bittersweet story I'm going to tell, of this kind of work in religion is a new center for womanist leadership, womanist being the term used by African-American women and women of African descent to describe their way of working in, in as it were, feminist directions, but as, a, as womanists. And we have had in the United States and in, in various parts of Africa, through the Concerned Circle of African Women Theologians, tremendous leadership by African and African American women in developing their own forms of ministry and working in particularly in black churches. And we had the great experience this spring in April of the inaugural conference of something new called the Center for Womanist Leadership. Imagine the joy of 225 mostly black women coming together to celebrate their project under the direction of Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, who is one of the great scholars of womanist work in religion. It was an amazing weekend. I was privileged to join. But I'm sorry to report that three weeks after the conference, Dr. Cannon received a terminal diagnosis, and her funeral is today. Memorial service for her, I should say, at, at her seminary in Richmond, Virginia. So I'm not sure how this latest new form, like Women's Spirit, like water, how, where will it go without the leadership of its charismatic and enormously 
um, important Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, if you don't know the name. But it tells me something, and I conclude with this, some tentative suggestions of how we might work together to enrich and deepen the scene. And I offer these in light of the uh, life and now being celebrated today, the death of Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon at 68 years of age, uh, started as a Hebrew Bible scholar and finished up as an ethicist. She was in uh, Hebrew Bible studies at Union Seminary, which had never had a woman of color in Hebrew Bible studies and weren't going to have her and put her out of the program. She was picked up by Beverly Wilding Harrison, their feminist ethicist, became an ethicist herself, and has, I think, provided singular leadership not simply for black women, but for all of us in terms of how issues of racism interstructure with issues of sexism, economic issues, and so forth. So I mention this because it's so important to see that here we have something new emerging that we need to nurture. So my suggestions are in honor of her and of the need to nurture. Let me make three simple suggestions, and with this I will close. Given the current theopolitical climate and the examples of the Women's March as one uh, expression in one country, although all around the world, of how religious dynamism and social action go hand in hand, what might we reasonably expect in the future? First, I think technology, social media, and the like will accelerate the rate of change, the speed with which new ideas about diverse and inclusive ways of being religious will take hold. Unfortunately, these same social media, technology, et cetera, will flame the, fan the flames of conservative ideology. This is obvious. But I think that many people have increasingly less tolerance for ideological foot dragging when lives are at stake. I think that's part of your experience here in Ireland. I can't say, but it, as an outside observer, where Catholics find it intolerable to hear anti-queer rhetoric when queer kids are killing themselves. Because cell phones and tablets are practically extensions of young people's hands, we need to use all of the contemporary tools at our disposition. Podcasts, webinars, Instagram, Snapchat, and things I've never heard of to carry on our conversations. I have a 17-year-old, so this is quite personal for me. And I work with many young women in my office. We've had over 85, I mentioned, uh, over the years, who are positively genius and just as generous in sharing their technical skills, for those of us who are not 35 any longer. We need young people to join our work and to shape its future, and we particularly need young women of color. And so that becomes, in my view, a real serious next step for all of our groups. A second is the rise of spiritual but not religious people, nuns or never-agains as the categories evolve. So that means that the work on gender and religion, indeed all of the infrastructured particularities with which we now analyze religions, must be done in concert with people who are not religious at all. When I think of the training that many people of my generation had, we studied if we were Methodist with the Methodists, if we were Lutheran with the Lutherans, if we were Jewish with the Jews. But now I think not only do we need to study with each other interreligiously, but we also need to study in a very serious way with people who are not religious at all, who don't want to be. One way that that conversation happens is not simply through classes, but also th through shared action like women's marches or soup kitchens, political campaigns, lobbying efforts, voting registration, whatever it, mean, whatever it is in your context where beliefs are articulated by actions, not actions dictated by beliefs. I delight in branching out well beyond religious circles. I get a little tired of religious people after a while, <laughs> present company excluded. But there are often, um, I think, many people who are not particularly interested in being religious but are interested in looking at the phenomenon and understanding how it works. And I think that's terribly interesting, and they are deep and beloved colleagues. That said, my third suggestion is that there are, and this may seem a contradiction, few if any fonts of vision and creativity as rich and as deep as our religious traditions. I mean, I, go to the Prado and figure that out. Think of religious art, music, and rituals, all of which are being reimagined according to feminist lights. Consider the insights of sacred texts that are under deep renovation by some in this room, by textual scholars. Think of the difference this is making in the consciousness in our societies. Then it's not hard to imagine newly minted coalitions of religious people who are gender inclusive, in economic solidarity with one another, anti-racist, pro-sex, speaking diverse languages, and using many media. 
They provide support and inspiration for social change, which goes beyond what any religious tradition singularly can offer. Then it's obvious why religious dynamism, as I've tried to describe it, and feminist action, as I've given an example of it, are important anchors of contemporary feminist spirituality and what difference it all makes in the world. I see us, Women's Spirit Ireland and Water, as sister groups that have many siblings around the world. I think of my friends who are into feminism and Santeria in Cuba. I think of the concerned circle of African women theologians. I'm reminded of colleagues in the Philippines and in Germany who are doing amazing work. Those who are struggling for abortion rights in Argentina. The good colleagues in Australia who support efforts to stop climate change that toppled their government recently and who welcome immigrants to that vast land. They are just a few of our many kindred spirits with whom crafting a better world is sacred, enjoyable, and hard work. Thank you very much for your part in it. I look forward to our future collaboration, beginning with our respondents and your comments. Thank you very much.